In lecture 10, I showed you two things that you could do as you move from simple into multiple linear regression. This section is going to look at two more. Uh, we can use categorical predictors now. Uh, we'll need multiple predictors to be able to do that. And also we can look at interactions between predictors. So let's start with categorical predictors. Not something that we've used yet, but some of our data sets that we've used uh, have them inside. Let's look at one of them. So we've used the uh, CARS 93 data set quite a bit. Let me make sure I load the mass library because that's contained in there. All right, so let's look at this. Uh, for these 93 cars, some of them have no airbags. Some of them have airbags just for the driver, and some of them have airbags for both the driver and the passenger. And looking at this, it looks like that's all of them, right? Have we used factors in R yet in this class? I don't think we have. So watch this. If I look at the class of this, class comes back as factor. Factor is R's uh, built-in class for dealing with categorical qualitative variables. Things that are not numeric, but well, you just have different categories here. One function that's useful for this is if you call levels on that, it'll come back and say, these are the three things that it's possible for this variable to be. Only three, driver, passenger, driver only, and none. Why do they put them in this order? Alphabetical, by default. Yeah, that's important because we might want to change that later if we want something different to come first. Okay, so how can we use this to predict, let's say, the price of a car? So that's be very different, right? Because I can't really put these on axis and think about this continuously like I can for uh, other predictors. I need something totally different. So let's build up. It's a little bit of mathematical uh, framework for this. If you've had me in other classes, you've definitely seen indicator variables. Uh, it's a variable that takes either the value one or zero. It takes one if a certain condition is met and value zero otherwise. I also see them called dummy variables. So I'm gonna write it kind of generically as this. The variable is X for some condition. And it's one, if that condition is met, let's say if condition true, and then it's zero otherwise, if the condition is false. Now in another class, I would define it even more generally where I would have a, a set down here. And I would say, well, if it's actually a function, if your input is in the set, you get a one, if it's not in the set, you get zero. This is just a special case of that that's going to be helpful for regression. All right, so one idea is we could introduce uh, three indicator variables for each one of these. One for driver and passenger, another one for driver only, and another one for none. That seems like a good idea, but something goes wrong. Does anybody know? Have you encountered what happens if you include all the levels of a categorical variable? Well, good, we get to learn it together. That's fine. Do you mean like one, two, and three? Or zero, one, two? Uh, not, not one, zero, one, two, or one, two, three, but well, well, we'll be able to visualize it on the next page. If I have a separate column of zeros and ones for each one of these. So I can, I'm going to define one of these for the none category for cars that have no airbags. I'll define another one for a uh, driver. Let's just use D for that. And then if it's driver and passenger, I'll use DP for that. So for any particular car, exactly one of these will come back as one, the other two will come back as zero, right? Okay. So it might seem reasonable to include all three of these indicator variables in a model. Let's, let's throw in one uh, numeric one to make it a little bit more interesting. We want to use length and airbags to predict the price of a car. So maybe a reasonable model is uh, conditional value of Y, given the data is 
As always, we include an intercept. Let me use L for length. So I'm not gonna number these as much as I just named them. So I've got my length, my numeric variable. I've got an indicator for if the car has no airbags. I've got an indicator for if it's driver airbags. And then another indicator if it's driver and passenger airbags. All right, so like always, I'm gonna start by setting it up manually. All right, so let's check this out. Uh, the double equals, have we used that before? Okay, yeah, that's, that's not a sign, but that's checking. Uh, if I look at the airbags, is it equal to not? It's gonna do that check for every row of the data frame. It's gonna come back with a, actually at first it's gonna come back with a, a false if it's not none and a true if it is. But then when I combine it with something that's numeric, all the truths become ones and the false become zero. So that's nice, it kind of, I can skip a step but in conversion where it does that for me. If I combine all these together, intercept, length, and then these three different indicators. So let me label them just a little bit. There's the intercept. Here I've put none first, and then I've got driver, and then I've got uh, driver and passenger. So this should be easy to read. The first car in the data set had no airbags. The second one in the second row had driver and passenger, the driver, driver, passenger, and so on. All right, now I know you can see below the, on the page, but don't look at it yet. Do you think this is going to work? You don't think it's going to work, why not? The dimensions, uh, I've, got, I've got five columns. For this to be invertible, for me to be able to get the inverse, I need it to have a rank five, to be full column rank. Do you see linear dependence in my columns? You can imagine adding this column plus this column plus this column. What's the result? <laughs> this column. Yeah, by including all of these, uh, I've introduced linear dependence. And so, yeah, you try that and you get error and solve. System is computationally singular. It can't find the inverse because there isn't one. So, yeah, mathematically, we've already talked through this. The columns are dependent. X is not full column rank. So X transpose X is not invertible. Uh, and one way to think about this more intuitively, do I really need all of those columns to get complete information? Or is some of it kind of redundant? So if you tell me a, drive, a car doesn't have driver only airbags and it doesn't have driver and passenger, do you then have to tell me that it has no airbags or can I figure that out myself? To be able to figure that out, yeah. So I've included too much information in this. I don't need all of that information. So there's several ways to deal with it. I'm gonna show you two of them. First, the most common way. Uh, treat one of your levels as a reference and just remove the associated dummy variable for that one. I actually don't include that one at all. Which one should you treat as reference? Uh, doesn't really matter. You can pick whatever you want. You'll get equivalent results at the end. So to me, it feels really natural to use uh, none as the, the reference level. So notice what I've done is this line that I did have here, that's been removed. So I'm only saying explicitly if it's driver airbags or driver and passenger, and I can figure out if it's nine based off of that. Like here, it's not driver, it's not driver passenger, it's gotta be nine. Driver passenger, uh, driver, and so on. We can figure out everything just from those two. 
All right, so then I set it up manually uh, with a do X, solve that, and now I don't get an error. But unfortunately, it did uh, separate it out over two pages. So there's the estimate for the intercept. I got to go to the top of page three to see the rest of it. I did have a name for length. I didn't name my other two columns, so they didn't survive into the beta calculation. I kind of wish I had now. This one would be for driver cars, and then this one would be for driver and passenger cars. And in a few minutes, we'll talk more about how to interpret those. But first, I've done something manually. I never trust myself. I've got confidence issues. issues. I want to do it using something built in and make sure I get the same result. As we saw at the beginning, R is going to give you uh, levels of your factor ordered alphabetically by default. So that would be driver and passenger. It's not what I wanted. So if you use re-level and the ref reference argument, you can say, put this one first. Treat that one as your reference. Then, when I call LM, I don't have to put in something for every level in the categorical variable. I can just put the variable name. I can just say airbags. And then it'll look at it as a factor and figure out what levels it has and do all of that out automatically. So let's check this out. All right, first, are these the same numbers that we saw before? Yeah, so they just did it in a different order because we did drive with third. Okay, and notice it doesn't show none. Don't get an explicit parameter associated with that. Just for driver passenger and driver only for the uh, non reference values. All right, now here's a good time to learn something that's useful. In a lot of examples, in pretty much every lecture, I've been doing something like I've been doing something like this to build the X uh, matrix myself. What if you want the X matrix, but you don't want to make it yourself? You just want to get it out of something uh, that produces it auto automatically. There is a way to do that. The model.matrix function. I didn't have it print because it would have you know, given me something really huge. Let's go look inside R and take a look at that. All right, so I think I need to start. Actually, I can skip all of that manual stuff. Let's just go here. Do the re-leveling, do the fit, just make sure the summary worked. Okay, that looks fine. Yeah, if I call model.matrix on the fit. All right, check it out. It set up that whole matrix for me. So I think from now on, I'm going to start using this. If I do want to do calculations manually, I don't want to set it up. I'll let it make this for me. I'll wait quicker. Now at the bottom of this, it says there's an attribute called contrast related to airbags. And the value is contrast.treatment. We'll understand what that means in a few minutes and then how to change that if we want a different way of including categorical variables. All right, what do we talk about next? Uh, interpretation. So let's go, let's go here for that. Length, that's a new variable. We know how to interpret this. For every additional unit of length, I think it might be measured in inches. We expect the price of a car to go up by this much. So the car becomes an inch longer. On average, we associate that with going up $200 in price. The others are getting more careful now. Is the intercept, is, is this the uh, average cost of a car with all of these values equal to zero? Well, for one, this is nonsensical, uh, negative cost for a car. Let's pretend that this is a different situation. This is within the range of the data. It's not just the value of all the variables equal to zero. It's the estimated value when all the numeric value variables are zero and all the categorical variables are set to their reference value. So we don't see an estimate for 
cars that have no airbags. It's because it's built into the intercept. Think of the, the nun level. It's built into the intercept. All right, so uh, how would I interpret these? Can you, can you guess what? Let's say the driver only one. For every additional airbag for the driver that's put into the car, the price is up by 6000 For the most part, but we only, that can only happen once. Instead, think of it as, as you move from the reference level, which is built to the intercept, to uh, this category, price of a car goes up by about 6000 What if you then move from, let's say, the reference category to a car with driver and passenger airbags, you now expect the price to go up by 11500 Get a little discount to get two airbags, $500 at all. That's true. It's not quite a not quite a multiple. So if we did try to treat this as zero, one, and two airbags, uh, we wouldn't get quite the same results as this. All right. So that's how we interpret it. Did that make sense? Agree with that? Yeah. Think of these as as you move from the reference level to this, this new level. The other thing is, and this this can be annoying. We get different, possibly different significance codes for this. Now here, we're kind of lucky because uh, both the, uh, all three of them, the intercept, which has none built in, driver only, driver and passenger, they're all significant at the 0.05 level. So we would want all of them in the model. What if we found that this was significant and this was significant, but then this one was not? What do you do there? Can, can you drop just some of the levels and keep the others? Usually that's not recommended. Usually it's it's uh, it's recommended to either keep all of the categories or remove all of the categories. The kind of picking and choosing is is frowned upon. However, having said that, I'm working on a project with a uh, psychology collaborator, and he did have a variable which was for the race of uh, survey participants. So it was for Georgia Southern students. So there was a large category for white, a large category for black. And then pretty small categories for um, uh, other ethnicities. And so he did decide, even before starting to analyze the data, to make like, a white category and then a non-white. So he did kind of collapse those into just two and made a simpler categorical variable. But he didn't go through and say, well, let's throw out the Chinese and keep, keep the other ethnicities in. Um, not good to drop things on a level-by-level -level basis. All right. Okay, let's look at the next page. Uh, I wanted to come up with some kind of visualization for this. Let's take a look at what I did. I set up an x axis for my numeric variable, which is length. Uh, and then instead of making just one data frame to have a new observation score, I actually made three of them. One of them for no airbags, one for driver only, and another for driver and passenger. And like before, I better make sure that I use the same names here as I use in the, the fitted model object. It's going to come looking for these things. So they all have varying length, but other than that, they're constant with respect to levels of the airbags variable. All right, uh, I guess I'll run this part. So make the axis, make those three data frames. Let's look at just one of them. So this one has driver and passenger all the way down. And then I've got a sequence for the length of the car. So I'm gonna go ahead and plot the numeric things, uh, length and price. And then I'm gonna make one line where I have the predictions when there's no airbags. Let's put that one on. Okay, so at that fixed level of airbags, I now only have two variables left, uh, length and price, and there's a relationship between them. 
Let's add another line, make it dashed in red for the driver level. I notice we just shifted it up a little bit. Now let's add the third one, driver and passenger. It'll be dashed in blue. That one gets shifted up even more. And then we can add a legend so we know what's referring to what. Uh, you can probably guess what are the differences between these if we zoom in a little bit. So we know that this lower one, that's the reference category, that's the none. What's the difference between the black line and the red one? Uh, 6.006. About $6,000, yeah. That's uh, the estimated coefficient on driver. So as you move from none to driver category, which is about $6,000. And so then what's the difference between the black one and the blue one? Yeah. So there's a way we can visualize those coefficients in action. They aren't slopes like the one for length is, but they're, they're jumps as you go from one category to another. All right, any questions or comments there? Um, so if you wanted to uh, make this look pretty, you could label some of those dots as red, blue, and black, right? Oh, that would be cool, yeah. That'd be a good way to do it. I'm wondering, should I use class time for that? Let's at least finish the categorical part. With, uh, That'd be really cool. That would be easy in ggplot too, but I'm not using ggplot right now. Okay, so uh, we've looked at one strategy for dealing with categorical variables, which is define a reference, just throw that one out, because it's kind of redundant if you know the others. And you introduce an indicator variable and a coefficient for all of the others. Here's something else you can do. I like this one whenever you have just uh, two levels. Instead of coding as zero or one, why don't we just code with negative one and positive one? And then not really think about there being a reference level. Just one of the levels you call the negative one level, the other one you call one. So let's look and see what I did. I actually don't remember this one well. Yeah, let's look at the origin variable. Cars 93. All right, so this one's also categorical. Definitely not getting numbers back. We're just classifying them as cars that are manufactured in the USA or are not in the USA. Categorical, just two levels. And at the bottom, we see those two levels printed out there. All right, I'm gonna fit a model with that. And let's look at that. I don't even wanna see the summary yet, just this will be enough. So it looks like it used USA as the reference level through that one now. And so then we have, uh, well, the effect of being in the being produced USA is built into the intercept. And then if it's a foreign car, uh, that's getting moved over here. So it looks like, Four cars are about $2,000 more expensive on average. I can believe that. I'm gonna call model.matrix and let's look at just the head of that. All right, well, let's see how we would interpret this. That's something I was going to write down. Looks like near the beginning of the data set, these first five, there's a one for the non-USA category. So these are the foreign cars. And then zero for non-USA means it must be the other category. There's the one from the top of the data frame that was constructed in the US. All right, and like I mentioned, we were looking at R a minute ago. 
the USA level is built into here. And then uh, I would interpret this as the additional expense of a foreign car. All right, so that's the same as the old approach. I haven't actually done anything new yet. I'm still using zeros and ones where you throw out a reference and you have a one indicator for all of the other levels. But I want to do something new. And here's the automatic way of doing that. There's an optional argument in LM called contrasts. And what you do is you pass in a list and then for each categorical variable that you have, you say what kind of coding you want it to use, what kind of contrast. This is a simple model, and I only have one, well, one variable at all, one categorical variable. And I'm saying for this one, let's use the sum contrasts, whereas the default one was uh, treatment. Default is contrast treatment. That'll treat it as uh, zeros and ones. This one, if you only have two levels, is going to use negative one and positive one. If I had other categorical variables, then I would expand this list. So if I wanted to do origin and airbags, then I'd do a comma, airbags equal, and then I would say what kind of coding I want for that one. Does that make sense? All right, good, because that confused me for a long time. I had to think about that a while. What's going on here? Uh, let's try running that with the contrasts argument. And let's look at the head of the model matrix for this one. And notice where I used to have uh, ones, I now have negative ones, where instead of zero, I now have a one. And if I look at this, is that exactly the same as before? It's kind of similar, it's not exactly the same. So let's think of this. All right, so now we're seeing these as the non-USA. And then here's the one at the top of the matrix for US car. The intercept is a little bit larger than it was before. It was 18.5. I now interpret this not as the average price for any particular level. It's the average of the two levels. It's kind of in between uh, one and negative one. Average price across both levels. And then I would interpret this as a deviation from average. Man, I mangled that, let me fix it. Deviation from average. I gotta be really careful because it's easy for me to make a mistake here. But if we're treating the USA as positive one, then think of that positive one being multiplied by this, we get something negative. If it's a US car, it's gonna cost about thousand dollars less than average. U.S. costs 1,000 less than average. If it's a foreign car, a non-USA car, which is being coded as a negative one, take that negative one, you multiply this, and now it becomes positive. A foreign car costs about $1,000 higher than average. Foreign costs, 1,000 more. 
So then the total difference between the U.S. and the foreign around 2,000, which agrees with the previous estimate that we had for coefficients using the treatment contrasts. Okay, I think that's, that's kind of neat. Any questions on that? About the same number of um, foreign as US birds? Maybe not. What would be a good quick way to find that out? Does anybody know? How do we find out how many there are of each? Because uh, some everywhere where it's true where it's equal to one and everywhere where it's true where it's equal to negative one. Okay, so you basically gave the same ideas. If you use which, you'll find um, you know, which ones are in a certain category, see how many of those there are. You can get trues. Both those are good answers, but actually there's a little faster way. Take a frequency table. Uh, cars, 93, we're doing origin. Nearly even split. Not, not quite, but pretty close. Yes. Yeah, I guess that answers my question. I shouldn't feel like this model is not fair if there's more than the other, because it's like taking the average price across both levels feels unfair if there's more than one or the other. But I guess that takes that into account. So. All right, so there's a good point. What if this had been more lopsided? Would there have been nine US cars, 10 non USA cars? Would we start to get more confidence in the estimate for the US and less confident in the other? What if we had an extreme case? What if there were 92 of one and only one of the other? Something bad gonna happen there? Wait till lecture 14 and we'll find out. I feel like the degrees of freedom will become a degree. Okay, yeah. It's pretty often we see things like n minus one in the calculations that we're dividing by. Maybe if you divide by that one minus one, you get a zero and something blows up. Maybe. Okay, do we have enough time to do the next section? <laughs> let's do this instead. Let, let's stop the lecture. I want to ask you a different question. Uh, we left off last time with categorical variables and we used indicator variables, uh, one indicator for each level of the categorical variable, except for one which we treat as a reference and that gets bundled to the intercept so we don't have redundant information. Here on the next two pages, I'll show you something else you can do with indicator variables. And it's kind of a minor topic. It's not something that I had covered uh, when I took a similar class, but it's brief and it's really neat. So I thought it'd be fun to spend uh, 10, 15 minutes on it. So sometimes we've got reason to expect the linear relationship would change at a certain value of a particular variable. So there's some break point and we can encode that information with an indicator and get not a global linear regression, but a piecewise linear regression that can change the breakpoints. So let's jump straight into an example. Uh, there's a data file, soap.csv, contains data on unit cost and lot size for producing batches of soap. And it's known, we have uh, domain knowledge, that bulk pricing discounts are going to apply to raw materials for lot sizes of 500 or greater. So we've got a reason to suspect that the uh, cost as a function of the size of the lot is gonna change at 500 because materials get cheaper. It's a pretty small data file or data set. And if I look at it, it doesn't look terribly nonlinear. Looks like maybe just a global straight line would work, but there's a little bit of a, it seems like it's a little bit steeper over here maybe. Yeah. Perhaps, so let's see how we can, how we can deal with that. So we expect uh, there to be a break point right here. And so we need some way of adjusting the model uh, so that the, the slope can change at that point. All right, well, so far I only have one predictor variable, which is the size of the lot being produced. So we'll call that one X1. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm going to define a second variable. So I'll call it X2 and it's gonna be an indicator. So it's either gonna take the value zero or one and it's zero if the bulk pricing has not kicked in yet. If the size of the batch of soap we're producing is less than or equal to 500 units, bulk, bulk pricing hasn't kicked in, we haven't crossed the break point, uh, the indicator is zero. And then it's one otherwise. If we're producing more than 500 units, bulk pricing kicks in. So I think of this as an indicator for the concept of bulk and whether that applies yet. Um, so I have a question. Yeah. So it says materials of size is 500 greater. So wouldn't the top one not have an equal and the bottom one have an equal? Oh, you know, that's a good question. Uh, is it going to matter whether we put the equal to part here or here? The phrasing suggests maybe it should be the other way around. Um, but if we get a continuity, then it really won't matter. We can do it either way. We'll investigate that. It's a good thing to be thinking about. So let's define the model to be uh, y is equal to intercept beta naught plus beta one x one. So the size, just like normal. And then the new part, we'll have a beta two. And it's not just x two, but it's going to be x one minus 500 times x2. Right, beta 2, x1 minus 500 times that indicator x2. And we'll figure out on the, the next page exactly why we set it up this way. But for now, I would say, think of everything that's multiplied by beta 2, all of this part right here. Think of that as actually one new variable that's being built. We're building it out of X1 and the breakpoint and, and the indicator X2. But just think of that as really just one, uh, one variable. I think of this as being the bulk excess. Because what's going to happen to this whole thing if X1 is less than 500? Negative. This part will be negative, and then it gets multiplied by X2 which will be zero. So the whole thing is going to become zero if you haven't got to your bulk break point. And that makes sense. You're, how much are you in excess of the bulk? You're not. Zero. But then once x1 becomes greater than 500, then you've got that difference just multiplied by one. So it's just picking up, is there a difference beyond 500? OK. Uh, on the next page, let's investigate in a little more detail. I kind of think of this as actually representing two simpler models simultaneously, depending on what the value of x1 is. So write a little bit small, at least vertically. So if x1 is less than or equal to 500, oh, I don't want to waste time on this. All right, sorry, I got to. i work on this for a minute. Maybe you can try to work ahead of me, see if you can guess what I'm going to do. All right. For x1 less than or equal to 500, uh, the model would simplify. Time to just buy a new one. It's not worth it. I'll be equal to beta naught plus uh, beta one x one. And then the indicator x two will be zero. So I can just leave that part out for the moment. So yeah, until you get to 500, you've just got an ordinary model, simple linear regression even. And so if we check at x one equal to 500, 
it's still going to be the same thing. Okay, so let's look at the other case and the other implicit model for not x2, but for x1 greater than 500. <laughs> So y is equal to beta naught plus beta one x one plus beta two x one minus five hundred. And in this case, I know that the indicator is going to be one, so I'm not going to write it. And I'm going to rearrange this a little bit. So the beta two times five hundred, uh, I'm going to group that with beta naught. And carry along the negative. That part doesn't uh, depend on x1, so that's kind of like my new intercept. And then beta 1 x1 and beta 2 x1. Let me group them, but then factor out the x1. Uh, beta 1 plus beta 2 x1. Just barely fit in my error term over there. So it looks like I'm actually getting a different linear model whenever x1 is greater than 500. Got a different intercept and a different slope. And then this model, this the second one, what happens at x1 equal to 500? Oh, let's see. I'll leave the intercept part alone for now. And then I'm plugging in x equal to 500. All right, I see a positive 500 beta 2, negative 500 beta 2. Those cancel out. I guess I shouldn't cancel out that 500. Uh, beta naught plus beta 1, 500 plus E. And actually now I remember way back here, I meant to actually plug in 500 for the, the X1 here. I'll just come in and erase that and replace it. All right, so I mean, we have to worry about if the less equal to part is on either part. Yeah, it's continuous. It's going to, to be at 500, and you'll get the same value for either part of that. OK, so I think that's a neat idea. Let's apply it now. Computationally? Like I tried to argue in the previous page, just treat this as a single new variable. So we'll take the value of x1, take the breakpoint value of 500, treat it as a constant. Uh, and then this indicator, I'm going to put that into the variable, into the model as a new variable. So this is going to be just like multiple regression with two predictors. We will do this as automatically as we can. We can fit the model automatically. Um, but if we want to use the predict function to, well, make predictions for us, we do have to set up that new uh, variable kind of semi-manually ourselves. So let's look at this. I'll go into R so we can play around with the code. Import the data set, plot it. Okay, yeah, that works. All right, let's see what I'm doing here. So I'm using the dollar sign to extract the size of the lot. I subtract 500. And I get some are positive, some are negative. But I, I want the negative ones to just be zero because I want this to represent excess uh, beyond the bolt breakpoint. So what's actually happening over here? That returns a logical vector. Either it is over 500 or it isn't. What happens if I tell it to multiply a number by a logical? Yeah, it automatically coerces all the falses into zeros, exactly what we want for the indicator, and all the truths become one. So then the whole line is 
Component-wise, this vector times this vector. Let's see what we get from that. All right, good. If it's less than 500, it comes back at zero. It's beyond 500, we get the difference. The excess. So you'll see that I saved that as a new column in the data frame. So now I've got cost, size, and then bulk. Well, let's fit a model that regresses cost against size and bulk. Okay. Beta not, beta one, beta two, just like I would hope. Uh, so then I'm going to define my x-axis. I want to make predictions all along here from around 300 to 800. So I make a, a sequence going from 300 to 800. Okay, that's exactly what it is. All right, then the next part might be a little bit tricky. If I'm going to make predictions, I know that my fit mod object sees the variable names as size and bulk. So I have to make a new data frame with columns, size, and bulk. Size is just x-axis, and then bulk is that same kind of transformation. So let's, you know, let's look at the, just this part. Takes the x-axis, sees how far it is above 500, and only picks it up if it's positive. So yeah, while the x-axis is less than 500, you just get zero. And then it's picking up how far it is beyond 500. That's perfect. Those are all the new observations I want to make predictions for. And then I'll actually call predict within lines so I can just get my Y values on the fly. All right, there it is. So over here, I get one line. It allows the slope to change, but it makes it continuous. Uh, and then I get a different slope over here. <clears throat> it's neat. Any questions or comments on that? Will there always be continuity between the pieces? The way the model has been defined, yes. You know, it might be a good idea to give you a homework problem where Sorry. I already decided to make it a homework problem. It's been a homework problem for weeks. Problem one is going to adjust that model a little bit. And Man, I guess I gave you the answer already. <laughs> Question A is how is the model fundamentally different? What is the interpretation of the parameter uh, beta three? Um, yeah, I mean, you still have to do the work of figuring it out and explaining it, but it's going to allow for discontinuity there. And I had to stop this morning. I've already written the exam, so it's too late. A good exam problem would have been what if there were two breakpoints? and you wanted it to be continuous. How could you set up a model that would allow that? But exam's written, so it's too late. All right, any other comments there? All right, uh, last topic, kind of a major topic in lecture 11 is interactions. I know some of you were at the stats graduate seminar where I gave some research ideas. A lot of that I actually pulled out of, out of these notes. So you'll see it again in more detail. The ordinary multiple linear regression model, it assumes that the variables contribute to the response separately. So we, we take one of those coefficients and we interpret it as, if you keep all the other variables constant, but you increase this variable by one unit, that's how much you expect your response to go up by on average. So it doesn't really matter what the values of the others are in terms of the change in the response uh, by the variable that you're focused on. That's not always realistic. Sometimes predictor variables interact so that the effect of one depends on the value of others. So uh, here's an example. Uh, Dr. Wanduku is a friend. Sometimes we'll get together and have a few drinks. And he thinks I should have just as many drinks as he does. Uh, but he's probably got about 75 or 100 pounds on me, right? So if, if I have three drinks and he has three drinks, is that going to have the same effect on our blood alcohol level? No, mine's going to go up way faster than, than his will. So uh, the effect of the number of drinks on blood alcohol level doesn't just depend on how many drinks you have, but also depends on, or the strength of that effect changes with body mass. All right, so there, there's one example. 
Here's another one. Uh, if I'm thinking about the fuel efficiency of a car, I would expect the horsepower, so the size of the engine, to affect that. And I would also expect the weight of the car, how much mass it has to move to affect that. So we might consider the model. Y, where Y represents price, equal to uh, intercept as always, beta one times X one. And let's let this one be weight. A beta two X two, we'll let this one be horsepower. Uh, plus an error term. <clears throat> But maybe they don't affect the response separately. Uh, I can imagine that maybe the effect of horsepower is a constant, but it changes as the weight changes. So maybe, I guess in a way we'd like it if, if these coefficients, like say beta one, could actually change as x2 changes. So is there a model we can build that will introduce that? There is. And I actually decided as I was going through the example, uh, that I wanted to consider these in reverse. I wanted to think about the effect of weight not being constant, but changing as horsepower changes. Now, in terms of the statistical model, is there a difference between horsepower's effect changing with weight or weight's effect changing with horsepower? Actually, no. Some of the, some of the investigations we'll do after will depend on which one we consider primary which one we think of as affecting the other, but the underlying statistical model uh, will be the same. So it's really just a matter of perspective and choice. Which one do I think of as affecting the other? So here's an alternate model. It's going to start the same way. Price is equal to intercept plus uh, weight plus horsepower plus a beta three x1 times x2. So I'm not adding a new predictor, but I'm kind of building uh, one out of the product of the previous two. All right, we would call this a uh, interaction. Often you'll see it written this way. I like to write it uh, this way. Let me take beta naught and then beta two X two and group those together. Notice that those are the two terms that don't have X one in it. And then I'll take the two terms that do have an X one, beta one X one and then beta three X one X two. And let me factor out the x1 on the right. So that becomes beta 1 plus beta 3 x2 x1. OK, check my algebra. It's the same thing. Uh, but I like looking at it this way because if I'm really more interested in the effect of X on the line. I really want to know what the relationship between X1 and Y is. Then I can treat this as my, I'll call this the focal predictor, because it's the one that I'm putting my focus on. Well, then isn't this like an intercept for the relationship between X1 and Y? But it's not an intercept that's a constant like usual, but it's a function of x2. And then the same thing over here. This is like the slope for the relationship between x1 and y, but it's not constant, it's a function of x2. And you know, I don't even think that I learned this kind of model in a stats program. I learned it by collaborating with social scientists to use these kind of things a lot. Uh, so I'm going to borrow their terminology because I like it. I think it makes sense. X1, they call a focal predictor. And X2, they would call a moderator. 
it moderates the relationship between x1 and y by changing the intercept and the slope at different levels of x2. And like I pointed out a minute ago, uh, couldn't I have instead treated x2 as the focal and x1 as the moderator and just done my algebra differently? Sure. So this is just a matter of perspective. How are we uh, perceiving and looking at things? Which one do we care about as being primary? Which one do we think of as moderator? You can switch that around. Okay, so our first job is figuring out, is this an improvement on the previous model? Should this term be in the model at all? How do you think you would figure that out? We're just going to run the test we usually do. Yeah, uh, if we're just testing the interaction, see if that's significant. We can do the t test to see if beta three is significantly different from zero or not. Now, if you're testing multiple interactions and you'd like to test those simultaneously, we're going to get to the f test in. I think lecture 13. Uh, okay, so yeah, I guess I'll come here. So first I did want to do a visualization. Need to load the mass library. Okay, so let's look at the plot. I'm treating, this is my response. Uh, I've got my two predictors down here, horsepower and weight. Do I have primarily linear relationships between my predictors and the response? Uh, this one's kind of close, but it could still be better. That definitely looks like a curve. And I think we did that model back when we did transformations, right? Yeah. yeah, so something that's purely linear probably won't work. But if one of our new variables is a product, that's gonna be able to handle some curves. So uh, this is another way of dealing with effects that are not purely linear, but they're curvilinear. Sometimes an interaction term will capture that. So first, uh, for comparison, let me look at a fit without an interaction term. That's what the no inter means. Let's look at a summary. So it looks like weight is highly significant. Um, horsepower once weight is in the model because yeah, it's not that significant. Um, and you know, let's simply adjust it R squared, 0.71. I've got all this printed out on paper. Yeah, I want to use this for comparison in just a moment, so I'll, I'll circle that. All right, as always, I want to do things manually at least just once. So you've seen that equation so many times when I copied and pasted it from my previous lectures a lot of times. Here, I've got intercepts, effect for horsepower, effect for weight, and then the uh, interaction term. If I were to do this automatically, most of the time I do, uh, this is really nice. In the formula, you can literally just multiply the names of the two predictors that you want to interact. Uh, so just like we write it out you know, in normal math notation, uh, the R syntax is really similar to that. So I create this fit. I look at a summary. Let's see if this looks better. All right, for one, do I feel better about the significance of all my, all my terms? Yeah. Man, that looks great. In terms of significance of each one of these, uh, they're looking really good. Okay. I've introduced another uh, variable. So I know that the R squared is going to go up. It always does. Yeah. Let's look at the adjusted R squared. This one went up. It was 0 0.71 before. So it looks like it's worth it. Uh, losing that degree of freedom with that new variable has reduced the residual standard error enough that, all right, yeah, this looks good. And again, we'll be able to do a more formal test, uh, an F test to compare these. Uh, after lecture 13. Is that a question? All right. Okay, so that answers my first question. Should we use this model over the previous one? And it seems like the answer is yes. Next thing we want to know is, uh, will they interact? What kind of interaction do they have? Is 
let's say, uh, is high horsepower making the effective weight stronger or is it making it weaker? Let's try to try to probe that. Show you a few different ways of doing it. We can do it with graphics, we can do a point-wise hypothesis test, and then an analytic method uh, that kind of inverts the hypothesis test called the johnson Mayman technique. So here's a, a brief definition. I guess three things can happen. One of them will be kind of neutral, but the two non-neutral possibilities are you get a reinforcement effect. So maybe the effect of X1 on Y gets stronger, and by stronger, I mean either more positive or more negative. So we get stronger in absolute value uh, as X2, the moderator, increases. So X2 can strengthen the effect of X1. Or the opposite can happen, it can make it weaker. Interference effect happens when the effect of X1 on Y gets weaker. So it's going to get closer to zero and shrink in absolute value as the moderator goes up. And that, uh, yeah, so here's a plot we can look at and visualize this. And let me sketch out what a prototype plot would look like if it's reinforcing, if it's interfering, and then if it's doing neither. So these kind of uh, plots, sometimes called conditional effects, sometimes called simple slopes, we're going to think about two values of the moderator. It's pretty common, especially when it's continuous, to let one standard deviation above its mean, one standard deviation below its mean. And then we look and see what the slope is, the line relating x1 to y, and you plot those on the same graph. So basically what you're doing, it's really simple. Let me go back. We're basically just calculating this part in parentheses for a low value of x2, a high value of x2. Since those are both slopes, we put the slopes on the same plot and just see if it got more positive, more negative, or closer to zero. When you make one, here are the three prototypical shapes. If there's a reinforcement effect, So for these kind of plots, your focal predictor, we're using X1, will be on the horizontal axis. The response Y uh, will be on the vertical axis. And let's suppose that when the moderator X2 is low, we get a slope like this. So I've made it kind of, kind of shallow, kind of weak, negative. What if it becomes more negative? as x2 gets higher. Well, it became stronger. In this case, more negative, so it reinforced the effect of x1 on y. So at first, I thought there was going to be some significance to crossing, but it isn't. It really depends also on what the intercept is. So just imagine, you don't have to draw this part. What if the high x2 had had that same slope and had been lower? Oh, well, it doesn't cross. So. Don't really think of the, the crossing as having any importance. Or if it does, it's not something that I, I'm aware of. All right, another possibility. Uh, an interference effect would look like this. So we've got x1 and then y. What if for low x2, the slope looks like that? And then you increase x2, and your slope looks like this. Well, it went from something negative to nearly zero. It weakened. It's shallower than it was before. And the third possibility, sometimes you don't have an interaction. Maybe for low x2, x2, the slope looks like this. And then maybe for high x2, it looks like that. So you know, maybe it changed the, uh, the intercept some. It didn't change the slope. It didn't change the strength of the effect of x1 on y. So no interaction. Get parallel lines.
All right, questions up to this point? Is this the same as like in um, design of experiments, we had something called interaction plots. And basically if they crossed, there'd be multiple um, parameters you were putting in. If they crossed, we said they interacted with each other, but if they were parallel like that, we said, oh, they don't affect each other, so you can remove. Is this the same concept? So I haven't either taken or taught a design and experiments class, but man, it feels like it's the same thing. I guess it's just on it's the same parameter being high and low. Yeah, I have to believe that that's, okay. that that's a really similar concept. Let's make one of these. I'll do one manually. And actually in the homework, I'm gonna point you towards a package that will help make these automatically. All right, so let's check this out. So if I'm treating horsepower as my moderator, I need to find a low value of it. So I'm just looking at its mean and going one standard deviation below. And then a few lines later, I call HD high, look at the mean and go one standard deviation below. All right, so then, these are those quantities that I had in parentheses when we first wrote out the, uh, the model of a slope as function of x2, intercept as function of, of x2. I calculate both of those when h p is low, calculate both of them when h p is high. I'll set up my plot, put on the low one first, uh, then the high one, and differentiate them. I'll make the line types different, and I'll make the colors different. And then I'll put a legend on it. So let's check that out. Okay, so I've got my focal predictor weight down here. I got the response y. And so the moderator x2 is actually kind of uh, implicit in the difference of those two slopes. So look at this and think about it. Do I have interference? Reinforcement or no effect? Interference, because it was moderately negative and now it's even more weakly negative. So it's like it gets weaker as force power goes up. I agree with that. I call that an interference effect. All right, and so now we can start to see a little bit how this can model something with a curve relationship. I don't have it here, but I, I did make the, some edits in the presentation I gave a few weeks ago. And I'll just tell you what the effect of that is without any time to change it right now. Uh, down here is where your lower horsepower cars tend to end up. You know, they've got higher miles per gallon and they don't weigh as much. And so if, if I'm looking more at the low horsepower cars and I'm focusing on this part of the graph, it makes sense for that to be steeply negative. That's the relationship I see over here. And then down here, these are the cars that are larger, that was correlated with having a uh, stronger, uh, stronger engine, stronger horsepower. So I'm looking, making my least squares line more based off the data here. And so if I could make lots of these, we would see a curve start to happen and show up in the line. Okay, so there's an example that has two continuous predictors. In homework, you're going to investigate a similar type of plot, except you're gonna have two categorical predictors. Okay, comments up to this point? All right, well, let me pose a question now. We very often do tests to see if a slope is significantly different from zero. If horsepower is low, that's probably significantly different from zero. If horsepower is high, is that statistically significantly different from zero? Maybe not, yeah, we have to do tests enough for certain. Uh, but it seems like if that pattern continues, and horsepower goes even higher. It's only one standard deviation above me. What if it's two? Is that line going to be nearly flat? Is there some point 
where the effect of weight on fuel efficiency stops being uh, significant as the horsepower goes up. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, at some point you're gonna have zero. At some point it's gotta flatten out somewhere if your car's still moving. Yeah, if, if that model, if that relationship continues. Uh, okay, so first we'll do a pick a point uh, approach to this. Here's how this works. The expression for the slope relating x1 and y as a function of x2, let's call that omega. Omega of x2 is equal to uh, beta 1 hat plus beta 3 hat x2. If you go back a few pages, that's the slope part inside parentheses. Well, this is actually a function of two estimates. Omega has a variance as a function of x2. And just using our ordinary covariance properties, it's going to be the variance of beta 1 hat. I'll put the covariance in the middle. Two times the x2 is treated as a constant. I'm going to go ahead and pull that out of the covariance. Covariance beta 1 hat, beta 3 hat, plus variance of the second term. Pull the x2 out of the variance, it gets squared. Uh, variance beta 3 hat. And now I'm really grateful that we've used the matrix formulation because. Uh, don't we know how to estimate both the variances and the covariances all simultaneously? Yeah, I think I remember this. The variance of the vector that has all the, the beta hats in it is sigma squared x transpose x inverse. Yeah, so if we can calculate this, uh, we can get all, all three of those quantities really easily. We'll have to estimate the sigma square of the MSE, but we also know how to do that, no problem. So that means if I need to estimate the standard deviation, Actually, let me make a minor change in notation. If I hadn't put the hats over here, I would call it omega. But since I'm using estimates, let me call that omega hat. So that would also change the hat and the variance, the omega hat there. It will, thank you. Well, this just means that I'm going to take the square root of previous expression. I will order one tonight. It will be here next week. Uh, let's see, sigma squared hat, beta one hat, plus two, two. So here, this is a subscript. So I'm saying this is my estimated variance of beta one hat. And then this would be my estimated covariance between beta one and beta three hats. And then an estimated variance of beta three hat. And I need that whole thing to be under a square root if I want the standard deviation of omega, omega hat. All right, so this would give me the standard error of the 
strength of the effect between y and x1 for a given value of x2, I can construct the test statistic out of this. I can calculate omega hat from the model. I'm going to be comparing it against zero. So I'm doing a, uh, a test for the significance of the slope, see if it's statistically significantly non-zero over this standard error that I have above. And if the null hypothesis is true, that follows a T distribution within minus three degrees of freedom. So what this means is I can take any X2 that I want, I plug it in and that'll change this. That's also gonna change this. These are both implicitly functions of X2. I can do a hypothesis test. Let's do that. Okay, so I do have, I want to make sure that I've run everything I need to before this. Okay, have we used uh, VCode before? Is this new? Okay, VCode is just finding X transpose X inverse and then multiplying by the MSC. So this has the uh, estimated variances of the three uh, parameters, and then I've got their covariances in the off diagonal. Actually, let me let me go back a page or two. Yeah, if I look on page 10. Actually, I'm just confusing myself. Because when I look at the standard error, wouldn't that be the square root of these things? It doesn't look like they match up. Am I thinking of this wrong? Oh, it's the wrong fit. Size and bulk. This is not even do with cars. That's why. I did not run all the lines that I needed to. Uh, right here. Okay, that's a totally different fit object. Let's look at the covariance of that. All right, this better makes sense. Okay, yeah, that's about 16. I take the square root of that. I get the four that I see on the standard here on page 10. Uh, the next one is really small. Yeah, that's going to be small. Okay. I can put in any X2 that I want. Let's start with uh, 140, horsepower of 140. So this is just setting up those calculations that I've, I've got on paper. There's a value of W, there's a standard error, there's the test statistic. All right, that's in the T distribution. That's looking very significant. Let's get a P value. Okay, yeah, very, very highly significant P value. Let me get the, uh, let me get this plot up. So I can point at it, okay. So what this is telling me is at a horsepower value of 140, the slope is steep enough, I don't think it's zero. In fact, I'm really confident that it's not zero. Let's increase horsepower a little bit. Uh, let's go up to maybe 170. Run all of that again, different test statistic, different p-value. Okay, not as, not as strong as before, still significant. Uh, let's go to let's try 195. All right, if we use the 0.05 cutoff, it's still significant, but it's, it's getting close. Let me try 200. Okay, let's try 205. Looks like right around there is where it crosses that significance threshold. So 200 horsepower, that's a pretty, pretty strong car. Looks like at that point, uh, we can no longer statistically say the effective weight on fuel efficiency is different from zero. All right, let me pause. Is this making sense? 
Uh, kind of complicated, but really just doing hypothesis testing. So it seemed around 205 horsepower is where we got a, a change from significance to not significance. Well, that's, um, that's kind of tedious, right? Having to put in the value manually, then uh, test over and over again. So a long time ago, you recognize the name Jersey name from other stats classes? And that's that too, you should get to the name here somewhere which is one of the really big uh, results in differential statistics. He and a student, who I don't think became as famous as his name was, but uh, they had the idea, well, why don't we invert this process? Instead of trying this X2 and that X2, let's go up here to the test statistic. Let's set this equal to the critical value. And remember, both of these are implicitly functions of X2. So then let's do algebra. Let's actually solve and find out uh, where you cross from significance to non-significance and find out what that value of the moderator is. It just takes a little bit of algebra. We're going to skip it, but we can see there's an x squared here and uh, yeah, with that x squared, you end up getting a quadratic that you have to solve. All right, so where do I have that? Okay, yeah, let's look at this. Let's step through it in here. So the first thing I do to apply the Johnson Neyman technique is, what's the critical value from the T distribution? It's often around two. Okay, yeah, well, 1.98 for these degrees of freedom. We're not doing the algebra, but we have to solve a quadratic, which means we have coefficients A, B, and C. And they're all in terms of that critical value, uh, values of the coefficient estimates, and then variances of covariances. So, those are my three coefficients. I can use the poly root function to solve. And let's see what I get. If we solve the quadratic, we might get a, a complex value result, but we didn't this time. You see, the imaginary part of this is zero. So, I just have two real numbers here. Now, just playing around, it looked like the significant threshold is around 205. That's what it is exactly. From this data, uh, 204.5767. Now, how would we interpret this other solution? If we have real solutions, we'll usually get two of them, unless we get a repeated root. Uh, yeah, can you, can you guess how you might, might interpret this? As horsepower goes up, the slope is getting weaker and weaker. If it keeps on going, won't it become, if it follows the same pattern, it'll become positive and then it'll become significantly different from zero in the positive direction? Yeah. But is that in within the, the range of the data? Can we make that interpretation here? So let's check. Uh, let's look at a summary of cars 93 horsepower. Well, the maximum horsepower value in the data set is 300. This would be extrapolating pretty far off. So we're actually just going to kind of ignore that. It's not in the con within the range of the data. Uh, we have no interpretation for that here. All right, it's making sense so far. In the context of this problem, though, it wouldn't make sense that adding more horsepower will get you better fuel efficiency, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So one thing I don't love about this example is we don't have only statistically gained knowledge, but we know enough about cars that if you increase the weight, I think your fuel efficiency is always going to go down. It, would, it would, does not make physical sense that you make a car heavier, more fuel efficient. That no, doesn't work that way. This is just statistical significance, not, you know, practical. All right, so that's nice. Now we know that we've got statistical insignificance actually on the right side of 205, and then significance on the left side. And we can turn this into a plot as well. So here's the code for making the plot. I think I'd like to just focus on it here. Let's try to interpret this. This is very different from the 
conditional effects plot uh, because what we have on the axes are not the same. Before we had the focal predictor down here, now we've got the moderator. So notice this is the moderator, not the focal predictor. And then on the vertical axis, almost always we have response values on the vertical axis. But not this time. It's the effect of uh, the focal on the response, the effect of weight on fuel efficiency. So this would be like the, uh, like the omega-1. All right. Um, or maybe even more simply, it's the slope. The slope of x1 on y1 as a function of x2. All right, let's compare this with the conditional effects plot from before. When horsepower was low, we had a fairly steep negative relationship. So I get negative values uh, right here. Tell me what the, what the slope is. And also, it's negative enough that if we make a, a confidence interval around it, it does not include zero. It's very significantly different from zero. But horsepower goes up, and as that steep line starts to level out, your slope starts getting closer to zero. And also, uh, as you get farther away from the average values in the data, confidence bands flare out. And so what happens right here where the confidence band crosses uh, zero? Over here, we've got significance. And over here, not significant. Where does that cross? That's around that 205 that we saw. All right, this took me a while to, uh, to understand because what we have on the axes are so different from what we normally have. It's a way of figuring out, is the effect of the focal on the response significant or not? So remember, there was another solution to this. It's outside the range of the data. And let's think about what would happen there. If we extrapolate out, and we know we shouldn't, eventually, somewhere over here around 3.30, uh, that's going to cross again. And so if the data were not that far, we'd have an area in the middle where it was not significant. And then on the sides, it would be significant. Here's a question for you. Uh, what if we had done this and we got complex solutions back? Can you interpret that? So if here's zero, if you've got complex solutions, it means you don't have real solutions. Does that mean your confidence bands never cross? What if that conditional uh, effect, let's say was something like this, and then the confidence bands look like that? That could happen. There is no crossing of the confidence bands uh, with the horizontal axis with zero. So that would mean it's never significant. So we've seen that it's possible that it's never significant. Maybe it's significant on the outside, but not the inside. Is it possible that it's significant on the inside, but not the outside? Oh, let's see, I can't actually click on that here, can I? Hmm. 
You know what? I'll just do it this way. So here's a, a paper about this with a software tool that looks at all the different possibilities. So there's one where you've got insignificance on the right, significance on the left. Here you've got significance on the right, insignificance on the left. Uh, there, significantly different from zero on the inside, but not the outside. Here, significant on the outside, but not the inside. Here's one where you actually do have two real solutions. It's missing across, but it's so far outside the range of the data that you would just say it's significant everywhere. And then finally, there's that last case where it's uh, not significant. All right, and I got to give a little, little bit of a plug here. This is a paper that I did with a psychology collaborator. So that's how I know about this one. Okay, that finishes off 11. Uh, let's not start with 12. I feel kind of bad for ending early two days in a row, but only got four next week. All right, let's look at your homework problems for this one. Uh, as already mentioned, number one is about those uh, piecewise linear models. This one looks like it's got one other term on the outside. Uh, play around with that, figure out what that's doing. Problem two, use the Palmer Penguins library and the Penguins data set. You can run this line to uh, Select. Okay, yeah, that will select those uh, columns, those variables, and then we're moving missing values. Fit a model for predicting the body mass of a penguin from species, sex, male or female penguin. Both those are categorical, right? Um, what about an interaction? Is an interaction between gender and species? See if that's significant or not. Use that model to predict the body mass of three kinds of penguins: a female Gen 2, a male Adelie, and a male Chin Strap. And I'd like you to set these up manually based off of the output uh, from summary. You can definitely check your answer to predict, but I do want to see if you can use the coefficient estimates and also the estimates for the interaction terms uh, to construct that yourself. Uh, this will construct an interaction plot for you. Look at that. I'd like you to write a paragraph connecting the elements of the plot to your linear model. So at the beginning of lecture 11, we looked at the three different levels of airbags. We were able to see the difference in those for differences in the coefficient estimates. Make some similar connections with, with this plot. All right, and then if you uh, run this command, that will summarize the average body mass of penguin but grouping by species and sex. Look at that and then make at least one connection there back to your linear analysis. All right, and then the final one's gonna come from the johnson Maiman technique. Uh, use the data that I provide to you. Modify the code from lecture to obtain the boundaries uh, to see where the response changes, effect of focal on response changes significance. Uh, Produce a Johnson Damon plot, and again, I'll give you code for that. And then it's install and load this package. And it's got a function by the same name, interplot, interactions plot. Uh, look at that and just notice it'll give you a Johnson Damon plot automatically. Kind of bare bones, you have to fill in titles and labels and everything, but it gives you something to start with. All right, let's make that do a week from today.